Uh, I'm going to be presenting uh, Hyperspy to you. I'm going to do a little bit of a brief introduction on how you can use it for general, uh, general purpose, uh, just signal processing. Uh, and then I'll go into more details about uh, the specific EELS processing features, uh, because that's what you guys are probably interested in. So um, first off, first things first, uh, just again, need to make a disclaimer. Uh, if I announce products, talk about products, not an endorsement, um, not a recommendation, and any, any opinions are my own and not the government's. <clears throat> And I also wanted to point out um, some help resources. So I don't know if these slides have been sent around yet, but they will be. Um, and there are a number of resources that you can access um, if you are trying to get started with HyperSpy and you know getting stuck. Um, the one that I really want to point out in particular is this interactive uh, chat room here. So that is uh, on a service called Leader. And uh, a lot of the developers and many of the users are quite active in that chat room and you can get very interactive feedback. Um, if you're having some trouble, can't figure out an error message, something like that, um, you should be able to get some help, some help there. Um, also, if you don't have those slides, uh, Sam did send around this, this website. Uh, it's this pages. Uh, sorry, uh, pages.nist.gov slash hyperspy tutorial. And uh, over here on the side at the very bottom, there's this getting help section and there's a link to some of those resources there as well. Uh, so I encourage you to ask for help if you need it. Uh, the community surrounding Hyperspy is very supportive and uh, very, very helpful generally. Um, I got some feedback that apparently the uh, there were some pre-workshop instructions if you wanted to install. Um, this will take some time. So if you haven't done it already, I, I don't recommend doing it right now. And I recommend you just kind of follow along and, and then you can go through later. Uh, the, the GitHub servers that uh, this bundle gets downloaded from are a little, a little slow during the day apparently. So uh, I, do, I recommend just watching and then um, you have all the materials or, or you will have all the materials if you click on this, uh, this little download button here uh, and then you can just go through them on your own time. Uh, and I think the recording of the session will be made available. So if you wanna follow along with me as well, that will be great. Okay, so uh, because this is unfortunately, usually we try to do this in an interactive fashion, but just due to the numbers and sort of the, uh, the general setup, I'm not going to be able to sort of stop and answer questions. So I'm just going to go through it and um, please feel free to contact me afterwards if you're having trouble. Um, please feel free to ask in the chat room like I was talking about. Um, so if you have installed HyperSpy, um, the way it, HyperSpy is not like other programs, right? It, it's it's a Python library. It's not sort of its own program. It's not like MATLAB where you just go to the command or go to the start menu and open up MATLAB and you get into it. Um, the, the bundle for HyperSpy that we have you install installs a version of Python for you, and it includes the Jupyter Notebook, which is a computing interface uh, that allows you to interact with Python within your web browser. And so the easiest way to do that, if you've downloaded the files and you extracted them somewhere, so in this case, I just have them in a file called HyperSpy Tutorial. Uh, the easiest way if you've installed via the bundle is just to right click, and there should be a, a, a couple commands here that were added by our installer. And you'll just want to click on Jupyter Notebook here. Um, I'm not going to do that because I've already opened it. But essentially what that's going to do is it's going to open this little command prompt window. And it's going to run some, uh, some, some commands that look confusing, but you don't have to worry about it. But then what it should do is just open up a web browser for you. And it will open up to a local, uh, it'll say local host up in the browser. And you'll just see a, uh, a representation of your file tree in, in the browser. Uh, and so this is the Jupyter Computing interface. So this is not written by HyperSpy. This is just a, an open source Python project. Uh, but we tend to uh, recommend people interact with Python through the notebook just because it's very easy for interactive exploratory uh, data analysis. And uh, we found it very, to be very amenable to what, uh, to what is possible within HyperSpy. Um, so I'm going to jump right into it. If you are able to uh, follow along, you're just going to click on one of these folders and that will bring you into that folder. And then there's going to be uh, some files within this folder. So there's going to be two notebooks in each one of the folders. Uh, and the, the, these notebooks are represented by this IPYMB uh, file extension. And I'm going to be working with the getting started notebook, but we've also included the getting started completed notebook. And so basically uh, the difference is that get the, the one without the completed suffix uh, doesn't have all the commands written into it. So it's designed for you to type them in and follow along. And so I'm going to uh, I'm going to be typing them in as, as we go. And then this completed one is sort of like the answer key. So I recommend um, if you open this one, try not to change anything just so you don't, so, you know, so you don't mess with what the answers are or make, maybe make a copy of the file or something like that. Um, one quick question, how can I get there using uh, the Linux OS? So if you've installed uh, the HyperSpy uh, installation into your 
environment, um, you're going to have to, uh, th there should be like a batch or a shell file, um, like a .sh that was installed somewhere, um, or if it installed, this, and this is something that I won't be able to help you with in too much detail, but if you've um, set it as your default, you just need to run Jupyter and then space and then notebook from the command line, and that should open it up wherever your command prompt currently is. Uh, if you installed it in a different Anaconda environment, if you know what that means, <laughs> you're gonna have to activate that environment and then, and then go into it. So I can help you with that afterwards if, you, um, if you're having trouble. Uh, so if you click one of these, it'll take a few moments, but it will open up, I, I do this ahead of time. And you'll see this notebook environment. So this is why we like using the notebook. Uh, it basically allows you to write some very well, good looking um, documents that are both well formatted in terms of look like a nice report or a nice paper and you can have links that go to places and everything. Um, but it's also an interactive computing environment. And so this is really, really nice, um, especially when we're trying to teach or something like this or share some results with people. We can sort of combine nice formatted documents with code and results and, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, so we're just gonna go ahead and get started. If you're following along with this, um, you'll see two different types of cells. You'll see these one, these kinds of cells that have uh, kind of just, um, sorry, like, uh, like a monospace font that look like a code font. And these are going to be your actual code cells that get evaluated. And to evaluate a cell in the Jupyter Notebook, you hold down the shift key and press the enter key on your keyboard at the same time. And so I can do that right now. Nothing's going to happen because um, this cell is just Python comments, so nothing is happening. But you can see it recognized that that cell uh, was evaluated. You can also click on this little button right here. This will run the cell. Um, but I, I like to use the keyboard. There's there's a bunch of other options up here you can, you can explore around. And there's also um, a help menu here that has a user interface tour and keyboard shortcuts and all that sort of stuff. So I'm not going to, I want to cover what HyperSpy can do, so I'm not going to um, get myself bogged down too much in there, but um, just know that there are some good resources uh, for that. Um, and sorry, let me make sure I got my cheat sheet opened here. There we go. I need to know what I'm supposed to type in. Um, great. So when you start with a, uh, a HyperSpy notebook, um, or a Jupyter notebook rather, that you're trying to use HyperSpy in, uh, at, because HyperSpy is just a third part, party Python library, so it's not part of the sort of base Python installation that you would get if you just downloaded from the Python website. So the first thing that we're going to have to do is do some imports. Um, so the first one that we do is actually a Jupyter command called matplotlib. And this essentially just uh, enables uh, interactive plotting and, and controls. And so we have to tell it a specific backend to use. I like to use the Qt one, but you can also use um, the notebook one. Um, I'm going to use Qt just because it is more it's easier to drag the windows around and show on a remote display, but notebook is nice because it puts the command, it puts the results of the plots back into your notebook. Uh, and then finally, or, or after that, we're going to import the actual HyperSpy library. So we do that uh, by saying import, import HyperSpy dot API, and then we give it an alias, that's a Python term. Um, so we say as HS, so then we can just access the uh, contents of the HyperSpy library just by typing HS. And so you press shift enter and, uh, if you're on my computer, which is fairly slow, or maybe yours the first time this runs, um, this can take a little while. Uh, and you'll see that you can see something is currently evaluating when there's a little um, asterisk here on the side. And you'll also see this little dot up here in the corner has become uh, uh, solid and it says kernel busy. And that just says that the Python interpreter in the back end, in the background, is, is running. Um, and this should hopefully be a little faster on your machine. My, my computer is just very slow um, because it is the one that I have to uh, do this on because of, anyway. So, right, so once that has finished, which hopefully, oh man, this is very slow. Okay, well, hopefully this will finish uh, sometime soon. Anyway, so there's a couple different ways. If you're trying to get help uh, within, within Python, there's a few different ways to do it. Um, most Python, most objects in Python have their own, and good, it finally finished. Most Python objects have their own um, help resources, and you, you can get to those in a couple different ways. Um, so any Python object, and this is not a HyperSpy command, this is just a Python command. Um, we, we've put HyperSpy into this variable called HS, and for after any variable, you can just type a question mark and then press Shift Enter. And that will actually open up within the notebook um, this little help panel that just has some of the documentation about that command. So this is similar to in MATLAB if you typed help, or maybe it's doc, I, I don't know MATLAB very well. Um, but uh, 
you know, you get some quick documentation about it and you can either close that with the escape key or there's a little X button here that'll just allow you to close that. Uh, another command that's very useful, um, everything in, in Python is more or less um, object oriented in, in terms of how you access it. So you will access things by uh, so, some variable dot and then something else. And those things within after the dot are, you know, pieces that are contained within that hyperspy object. Um, so I got a question, uh, you got an error, traits UI, G GUI elements are not available. That's actually just a warning. Um, that's okay. Um, I think, think it should be okay to, to keep on going. Um, so if you want to see what's contained within an object, you can use uh, the DIR command. So it stands for directory listing. It comes from old Windows terminology. Uh, if you run that, you'll get some, some response and you'll get a few sort of um, built in things that you don't have to worry about, but then you'll see the actual good stuff that, so this is sort of the, the base level things that hyperspy includes that you can, that you can access. So you can see there's a data sets, there's markers, there's models, there's plotting commands, um, there's region of interest commands, signals, you know, all that sort of stuff. You don't have to know exactly what those are right now, but just know that whenever you're interested in trying to figure out, you know, what can I access from this, from this object, uh, you can use the DIR command to figure that out. Um, so Hyperspy in general provides a few things. It, it has a collection of signals that uh, are basically just data containers that you can use to inspect your data and do manipulations on it. And those are contained within the hs.signals uh, package or, or uh, attribute rather. Um, there are functions that operate on signals. So uh, some of those will be contained in the signals themselves. Some are such as hs.stack will allow you to stack multiple signals together and build up uh, multi-dimensional cubes. Uh, there's also hs.plot. Um, there's also a bunch of model classes that allow you to model your data uh, and do fitting to actual real data. Uh, there's a database of chemical elements um, that have information such as x-ray lines and eels edges, that sort of thing. That's all contained within the hs.material attribute. And finally, there's some example data in the hs.datasets. Um, or, so uh, what we can do if we want to look at, okay, what do we have access to within hs.signals? We can do our dir command again and say hs.signals. And we run shift enter and you'll see we get, again, we get some of these built in things that you don't have to worry about down here, but you'll see some, uh, we have a base signal, we have EDS SEM spectrum, EDS TEM spectrum, um, signal 1D and signal 2D, those are generic, but we use those a lot. Uh, basically, this is a spectrum and this is an image. Um, and then we have some other complex signals and, and such, such like that. Um, so we can, we can access some uh, sort of example data. So if we say, uh, and we can assign it into a variable in Python. So we'll say s equals, and that will assign a, a something into that variable s. Uh, so we'll say hs dot data set, uh, data sets. And then if I press dot, and then if I start pressing the tab key, I should see, um, yeah, you might have to press it twice or a few times. And uh, Jupyter should be smart enough to pop up this little tab completion window. So you can hopefully see, and you can tab through that with your, um, or sorry, navigate through that with your arrows. And then you can just press enter. So I want to get an example signal. So I'll press the dot, the period, and do another couple tabs. And I'll see, oh, OK, I have an example EDM, EDS TEM spectrum. Um, and this is a method, so I have to put parentheses on it. So I'll run that, and you'll see it return very quickly. But you'll see it didn't return anything to us because we put whatever that happened here into, into S. Um, so I'll just type S and evaluate that. And I'll get a nice little um, text, text window. Um, someone asked if they can, if I can maximize my window. I'm sorry, I'm not going to just because, and you'll see for in a minute, I'm going to be doing some plotting and uh, I want to keep this area open to see, to see the plots. So um, I can try to make it a little bigger. Hopefully that will, I don't want to do it too big because then things will go out of view and get kind of messy. So hopefully that's, uh, hopefully that's a little bit better. Um, right. So if I just type S uh, and, oh, so this is what happens sometimes when you zoom in because these notebooks are kind of large. So it takes, <laughs> it takes a little while to render it in your browser. Um, okay, so I typed S and I got this output back. So this is just a text uh, representation of this data, right? So I can see it's an EDSTEM spectrum. It has a title, EDSTEM spectrum. And it also gives me some dimensions and we'll talk about what this means in a bit, but basically it's 992 channels uh, of spectrum. Um, and so like you might expect, I can plot very easily. I can just say S dot plot and then I give it those parentheses. And uh, if you use the Qt backend, you, it should pop up a window. If you used the uh, notebook backend, it would go in the plot. And you'll see sometimes um, it looks like nothing happened. And this is just, uh, it depends on which system you're on. Windows is um, 
So Windows is worse than others. Um, sometimes Mac is better than others, but essentially what you'll get is this um, plot window that may pop up in the background. So you may have to go into your tech, into your um, taskbar down here to find it. Um, and you'll see we get a TEM spectrum, an EDS TEM spectrum, exactly what it looks like. Um, so this plot's open. This has become, um, this is interactive. So you can click one of the things up there and you can pan around the symbol if you, you can click this little um, magnification box and, and click and zoom into a particular, a particular area and you'll see that spectrum. Um, you can press the home button here that will reset your view. And then there's a couple a couple things you can change your layouts and you know that sort of stuff. Um, there's, there's a few different options. And you can also click save up here that will uh, download the uh, file to your um, so that's a huge screen. I don't know. Uh, Windows is funny when you connect a high, high resolution display to a non higher resolution display. Okay. So that's how you sort of would see a plot, right? So um, something that I, I mentioned, we have in Python, we have something called auto completion, um, which is very, very useful. Um, and so to do this first, we're going to just uh, to sort of demonstrate this. I'm going to create a signal here. So I'm going to create just a dummy signal named um, 10. So I'll say 10 equals hs.signals. And this time I'm going to use a signal 1D. And if you're following along, it's very important that you match the case here um, because uh, Python is, is case sensitive. And if I scroll out of the screen, I apologize. I, I want to get through all the material. You can always open up that completed notebook um, back here. If you open up this one, you, you should find all of those commands uh, if you wanted to see those in, in real time. Um, and so I'm just going to pass this a list of numbers and nine. So you can see this is just a list from zero to nine uh, within a, a pair of square brackets. And if I do that, I created a, 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 a signal, right? And if I just, this is an example here, if I just type the, the letter T and then press tab, you'll see I get a few, a few options. And one of them, these are just sort of generic things that are available from within Python, but one of them is 10. So I can just press enter there and then I can press shift enter and I'll see what's in there. And you'll see it's a signal 1D, that's just a spectrum. It doesn't have a title because I didn't give it one. And you'll see it has dimensions of 10, like, like we may expect because that's how many uh, values we gave it. Uh, you can also, like I said before, you can see what's available after. Um, sometimes this won't show up if there's too many things. Jupyter won't render them all right away. Um, but if you press like the first letter, if you know the first letter of your command, for instance, you know, 10.p, you'll then see all the different options that are available there. So there's plotting options, there's um, different types of plotting options. And the one that we're interested in here is maybe this print summary statistics. So I'm going to run that. And you'll see we get just some very basic uh, statistical information about you know, means, averages, standard deviations, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and so according to the instructions, I was supposed to do that down here, but that's okay. All right, so that's just sort of some very basic, um, some very basic introduction to how you uh, work within the Jupyter Notebook within HyperSpy. Um, so what we can do is actually load some data. So one of the great things about HyperSpy is that it's able to read a large number of um, proprietary commercial formats. And chief among those is the digital micrograph format, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. So if you want to load a file, uh, you, can, you can run hs.load and without anything, and it should pop open a file browser. Um, but the way that we prefer to do it is to put uh, within either, you can do either single quotes or double quotes, it doesn't matter. Um, but you have to tell it that this is a string and I'm going to give it a file name. And so if we go back to our little folder right here, we can see we have two DM3 files in this folder. Um, they start with 005. I'm just going to type in 005 and then press tab. And you'll see it will complete the names of any files that are in that current directory. Um, so I'm going to open the uh, full range dark reference corrected file. And I'll just press shift enter and you'll see that loads pretty quickly. And if I look at what's inside the S variable, you'll see I get a little bit more information this time. So it recognized that this was an EELS spectrum. Um, so it knows how to read the GTAN for file format, knows that it's an EELS. Um, the title it just assigns as the name of the file, the file name, right? So that's, that's something. And then uh, we have some uh, different information within the dimensions uh, uh, area this time. And so you'll see this basically, uh, as you saw before, after the little pipe symbol here, after the little vertical line, we had sort of the number of energy channels or the number of spectral channels. And so that's 1340 in this case. And then we have um, two, what we call navigation dimensions. So these are sort of your X and Y dimensions. Um, so this is a 65 by 79 uh, X and Y by 1340 energy channels uh, spectrum image. So we can uh, very quickly see what the shape of our data is just by, just by inspecting the, the variable that we put it in. Uh, along with the data, we get all of the original uh, original 
metadata from, from the file um, from digital micrograph. So this is going to open a very long, uh, very long thing. And Jupyter should be smart enough to automatically collapse it, because if it didn't, it would like run off the screen many, 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 many times. Um, you can click on the left little bar here to sort of unscroll the output to, to make it all in. But basically, digital micrograph writes tons of metadata, and a lot of it is not particularly useful. A lot of it is color lookup tables and stuff like that. But basically, all of that metadata, and this is a very long lookup table, but there's some interesting stuff once we get past this one. Right, there we go. There it is. Um, so you can see all of the metadata that would be visible within sort of the tags window. So I, I actually have um, DM opened here so I can show show this. If you were to right click and click uh, image info, this is the same thing, and then went into the tags within image tags, and you have all of this metadata in here, uh, that's where all of this is getting uh, read from. So basically anything that you can access within the metadata of, of digital micrograph uh, should be present in Hyperspy as well. It should read all of that. Um, and, and that can be very useful. And that's actually, we use a lot of this, uh, if you saw the talk yesterday when I was talking about how we automatically extract metadata from information coming off of our microscopes, this is the functionality that we use to do that. Uh, besides original metadata, there is another attribute to a signal just called metadata. Uh, and this is the one that you'll use more frequently. So the one, original metadata is sort of everything that we read from the proprietary data format. Metadata is just the stuff that we use actually within Hyperspy. So it's the actual values that get used in various places within Hyperspy. And it's a much more concise uh, set of metadata, but you can see it's it's a lot of the important stuff. So for eels, it's the collection angle, the dwell time, it's it's the acquisition mode, it's the, um, the beam energy, the camera length, all that sort of stuff that you would use in various calculations within Hyperspy, that all gets included. Uh, and then there's some general metadata such as date, file name. You can see it reads the file date correctly. So this one was collected back in 2014, um, the time, and some signal information, that sort of stuff. Um, you can edit this metadata if it's not correct. Um, you can say s.metadata, and then just as sort of in the directory tree here that you see, or not directory tree, but in the, in the hierarchy that you see here, uh, you can access any of those metadata parameters so, and change them. If you, if you know, for instance, your convergence angle was wrong, uh, we can see that that's under acquisition instrument and then TEM and then convergence angle. So I'll say s.metadata dot, sorry, let me scroll that up so it's a little clear. Uh, clear. So I'll press AC and then press tab and you'll see it completes to, excuse me, acquisition instrument. And then I'll press, uh, I'll start typing in TEM, great. And then I'll see what, see, okay, convergence angle, great. So I can access that value. I can see that it's 32. Um, but more specifically, I can just say, oh, I knew this, I know this was 30 millirads. It wasn't 32. So I can say that. And then if I um, just access that again, I could copy and paste from above, but I'll type it out. You'll see that it's been changed to 30. And if I um, inspect the, maybe just the acquisition instrument branch of the metadata, you'll see that I have a uh, convergence angle down here has been set to 30. So you can always, you can always um, modify that metadata if you know it's, it's incorrect. Uh, Hyperspy signals also have a, uh, an attribute called the access manager or axes manager, um, which is very useful. Um, and that's just, you can just uh, access the axes manager. Um, and this will give you a nice, within the notebook, it'll give you this nice sort of formatted um, HTML table. And you'll see some summary information about um, what we, uh, Hyperspy splits things into navigation axes and signal axes. Uh, and this will be a little confusing at first, but becomes clear why we do this as, as you sort of get familiar with it. Um, and so we have navigation axes X and Y, how big they are in terms of pixels, um, the scale gets read correctly from the file, the units are nanometers, and then the signal axis is energy loss, again, the energy loss offset, the scale, and, and the units. Um, and so this is very useful. You, you, you may find yourself <laughs> using this a lot. Um, you can also, um, uh, you can index the axis manager. So this is a Python terminology, but um, if you say s.axis manager and then use square brackets, so you can say, for instance, um, zero, and Python is zero indexed. Um, and so if you press uh, shift enter there, you'll see I get a single axis back and it gives me a text representation of it. It says, oh, it's the x-axis, it has a size of 65. And currently the index in, within that access, it, axis is, is zero. Um, you can also, uh, sorry, you can, s dot axis manager, um, you can index this by um, axis name. So we could just type in a string here, energy loss and shift enter, and you'll see we get the energy loss axis this time. So uh, we have um, this time the, the size is um, 1340. 
And then uh, you can programmatically, so I'm just going to copy this because I don't feel like typing that. Um, you can programmatically access any of the values from this. So we could say dot scale, and you'll see we get 0.7. Uh, or you could say the units as well. So you could say you, you would get EV there. So there's a bunch of different ways um, that you can uh, access that information. You can either look at it up here, or if you wanted to use it in a script or something, you can access it programmatically as well. Uh, Hyperspy has a couple different GUI packages available. Um, so this was one of the questions I got was about um, a, a warning that popped up. Um, by default, only one of them is installed, um, and so or or only one of them is activated. Um, this is sort of a uh, this will go away in probably a few months to a year as we sort of continue development. But um, we used to have an older UI, which was the traits UI, and now we have a new one called IPy Widgets. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, but basically that puts the GUI into the notebook. Um, but all of that is to say uh, you can access various uh, components, basically interactive GUI bits um, for various components. Um, the access manager is one of those. So you can say .gui on the access manager. Uh, and if things are installed correctly, that should return to your um, notebook window here. And so I've zoomed in so you can't see um, the second one. But here, you get sort of interactive information. And you can change this information if you wanted to. Um, Within here, so you get you can see you can collapse these. Access zero, access two is the is the energy loss access, um, and you can collapse those and and see. And see. Um, these are what are called IPy widgets. Um, these are built into basically built into the Jupyter notebook. Um, if you have any dialogues that pop up outside of the notebook, those are going to be those traits UI elements, and you may get both. I, I, it depends on I, I forget what the default installation is, um, but if you say HS dot preferences dot GUI, uh, you'll get a little preferences window um, pop up. And under this preferences uh, window, one of them is GUIs. And you can see I only have the IPy widgets GUI uh, activated, but you can also, you could enable the traits UI one. I think that warning message that someone got was because this was probably enabled, but didn't have traits UI installed and that's okay. Uh, you can just click away. You can also ask it not to warn you. Um, but there, there's other options in here. Um, there's keyboard shortcuts. Um, there's some EELS information if you have access to digital micrograph and their sort of advanced um, generalized oscillator strength tables, you can get better EELS fit in as we'll see. And there's some some EDS defaults type, type stuff. Um, so you can click save there. Um, there's usually, I thought there was a way to close this, but you can just leave it open. Um, if you don't have any of the GUIs enabled, there is a shortcut to do this programmatically. So <laughs> if you don't have any GUIs enabled, nothing will pop up when you run this command. Um, so you can act, you can basically turn these on or off um, through through a, uh, just a programming command as well. Okay, great. So how do we plot the data? So let's let's look at what is in that s uh, s variable, right? So we have um, a couple of windows here that pop up, and I'm going to just resize these a little bit uh, so you can hopefully see them. Um, so you'll see we get what we call the navigator window here, um, and then we also get the signal window up here. So the signal is the whatever was on that signal axis. So remember, we had the energy loss axis of the signal, and the navigator had the, uh, sorry, I'm on a computer with a funny resolution, so sometimes it kind of gets messed up. Um, so we have the y-axis and the x-axis, as we expect. You'll see as we browse around, uh, you can see in the bottom left of my window, uh, we get the current value, both X and Y, and then also the intensity of that value. Um, and so this shows just a sum image of basically, a, the intensity that's shown here is a sum over the energy axis at each pixel. Uh, and on the, on the signal plot, you'll see we can get, uh, we'll, we get the energy loss values down here in the corner as well, and then also the intensity. Um, we can click and drag this little pointer around and you can see we can just sort of drag through and just as you would in digital micrograph or, or anything else, you can um, see the how the uh, energy signal changes at, at, a, at a given time. There's a couple of useful shortcuts here. You can also use the arrow keys. Um, if you have a really small, like large resolution, this happens to me on mine, um, sometimes it's difficult to grab this little pointer depending on how, you know, how many pixels are in your image and how big your window is. Um, and so if you press the plus key, on your keyboard, you can make that little wind, that little grabber a little bit bigger. It doesn't change what gets shown in here, like it's not integrating within that. It just makes it bigger so you can um, grab it easier. Um, you can also press the E key on your keyboard and that will create another little picker. And so you can drag that around and your window over here will now show two different spectra that you can sort of compare and contrast. And remember, um, you can still on this plot, you can zoom in, right? So if we were interested in you know, what's going on right here, 
um, the difference between these two, uh, we can click this little magnifying glass and do that. And then we can drag around and see, oh yeah, okay, that's that's the difference there. Interesting, okay. Um, so, and you can also press the E key again to get rid of that second picker. Uh, great, okay. So um, also a good shortcut to know, so you can just drag these out of the way. You can also close them. Um, we use uh, matplotlib is the library that does all of this plotting. And there's, there's a handy function there called plt.close. Uh, and if you tell it to close all windows and run that, it'll just close all the figures that you have open. So that's that's a good one to know if you try if you open up way too many uh, windows. Uh, okay, great. So now we've shown you can plot a uh, basically a, a, a spectral signal. Um, what's really nice in Hyperspy is Hyperspy is designed around multi-dimensional um, data access, and so it's that data in this case in the uh, hyperspectral data is just a data cube right it's x y and energy and it doesn't matter which sort of viewpoint you take on it whether it's i look at it as an image that i browse around and pick a spectrum or i look at it as a spectrum and browse around and pick a particular plane to to image like an f tem or, or a filter an energy filtered uh, image um, so we can just we can do this uh, very easily. We can switch our perspective, if you will. So we can say in equals s dot, and then there's a command called two signal to two d, and that will just convert our um, convert our existing sp sort of spectrum focused image, which was a signal one d, an eel spectrum, and convert it to uh, an image representation. And so if we look at uh, what's inside the im, you'll see this change now. Previously, we had eel spectrum signal 1D. So now we have signal 2D. The, eight remain, the title remained the same. But you'll also notice our dimensions change, right? Previously, we had 65, 79, and then vertical line and 1340. Now we have 1340, vertical line, 65, 79. And so what that means is that we've basically swapped our dimensions, right? We've swapped what was our signal dimension has now become our navigation dimension. And what was our navigation dimensions has now become our, our, our signal dimension. So if we say im.plot, we can do that again. Uh, we will get the data in a slightly different fashion. And we will get our navigator looks a little bit different and our signal now looks different. So our signal is now the image, right? And our navigator now has this vertical red line and our navigator is the sum uh, energy spectrum. And we can navigate through this and we can see, oh, here at the titanium edge, Oh, look at that. We have some nice uh, atomic resolution uh, data there. And we can go to the barium edge as well, or the, or the uh, niobium edge, I think this is, and, and, and see that we have, have that there too. Um, so this is a very nice way to just sort of change your perspective on data. So you can always look at your data from whatever angle you want. Um, you can close that window. Uh, so you can also, rather than remembering two signal 2D, uh, you can also just use uh, the transpose command. So we can, um, we can say s dot transpose here, um, or we can use a shortcut, which is just dot and then the capital T. Uh, both of those will do the same thing. They will transpose our um, spectrum oriented data into image oriented data. Uh, and, and that's just a shortcut for that. Um, and if you wanted to do that all on one line, you could say, oh, I know I have S and it's a spectrum focused image, uh, spectrum focused view. I can say S dot T dot plot, and I don't even have to store it in another variable or anything. I can just chain commands together like this. And I can run that and I'll get the exact same output that I did previously um, when I assigned it to the variable m, right? I get the, the same thing. Um, so Python's very nice. You can chain commands together very easily. I find myself when I, when I have to use MATLAB and you can't chain things together quite as easily in MATLAB and I find myself getting frustrated that <laughs> um, this is a really nice, a nice um, part of, of Python. Okay, so say that we, uh, we transpose this data and now we want to save it to disk, right? So uh, we can do that very easily using the save command, right? Um, that makes sense. And we can, uh, in here, we just give it a name. So we will say eels transposed, right? Uh, and if I run that, I should save it to disk and my disk is very slow. Um, and then, uh, oops, sorry. If I come over here, you'll see that I have a new file in my directory called eels transposed.hspy. So hspy is the default hyperspy format. Um, you don't have to worry about that. Um, you can also save as uh, any many other formats. Uh, you could say eels transposed dot tiff. And if you do that and come back here, you'll see we got a new file in here, and it's a tiff file, right? And so that's you could open it in ImageJ or, or, or anything else. Um, what's important to note note is that if you were to say hs um, basically reassign im and say eels uh, transpose and load the TIFF file, 
And now I'm going to plot what I just loaded back into M. Uh, there's some important distinctions here uh, that, that I wanted just to point out quickly. Um, previously, we had the uh, X, Y, and energy loss axis. And if you look now, now we have width, height, and image series axis. And you'll see we've, uh, we, we've kept our, um, our calibration here, um, but it's, we've lost our axes names. Um, and if we had other metadata assigned within here, actually, if I create a new cell up here and just say im.metadata, you'll see we, we don't have any of our eels metadata anymore. And that's just because in a TIFF file, there's no, there's no standard place to write that sort of information. Um, and so I bring all of this up just because, uh, just to point out that if you're saving your, if you're saving your data, the only way to ensure that all of your metadata, everything that you've done to that signal gets saved as well, is to use this format where you save it as um, the default hyperspy format. You could even write here if you wanted to make sure specifically, you could say eels.transposed.hspy. And you'll see if you try to overwrite a file, it says, hey, do you want to overwrite that? And I'll say yes. Um, and then now if I come down here and say, if I reload this as the hspy and load that and reload the metadata, um, oh, you'll see I, I just, I, I saved the, uh, my mistake, I, I saved the version that I already loaded as a TIFF, so I just overwrote everything. Oops, that's okay. Um, if I say s.t.save and then overwrite that, should work. I'm going on the fly here, so hopefully this, this, this works as I expect. And I read the metadata after it's finished. Okay, great. So now I have that yields metadata once again because I saved from the hyperspy format into the hyperspy format and then loaded that hyperspy format back. Um, so always use the hyperspy format if you are in, if you want to maintain all of your important metadata. Uh, great. Okay, so we're going to do some um, indexing now. So this is just a little example of how we can access information within within hyperspy. And I'm going to go through this a little quickly just because I want to get to the yields stuff. Um, so this is using a, uh, a, a, an image that's in this directory already. You should have it. It's called astronaut.hspy. And this is an RGB image. So if we open that up and say we look at what's in M, you'll see we get, uh, we have, it's a 512 by 512 image, but you'll see we have a signal dimension, or sorry, a navigation dimension of three. Uh, and if we plot this, we can see what, what's going on. Uh, you'll see we get the, the plot, the image window, but we also get our navigator here, which has three channels. And if you browse through that, you'll just see, oh, okay, this, this is the red, the green, and the blue channel. Um, but Hyperspy does not display that as an RGB image by default. It assumes that you're interested in the actual data. Uh, and the best way to display that sort of by default is in a grayscale format. So we just get grayscale representations of the red, green, and blue uh, channels. Um, we can uh, use uh, uh, what are called slicers uh, within within Python to um, get access to certain parts of the of the spectrum or of the data cube, and this is really useful. Uh, and we do this all the time. Um, so in this case, we have. Uh, oops, sorry, I skipped one. Um, you can plot these side by side. You can plot the channels side by side. There's a command within the plot attribute of Hyperspy called plot images. So hs dot plot dot plot images, and if you pass it something that has um, many images, so this has three different image channels, and you pass that. You'll get a nice little display here. Um, if I make this bigger, it won't it won't overlap. Sometimes this will happen depending on the size. Um, you can come up here and you can click um, this configure. And if you click tight layout here, it, it'll just bump the plots around um, to make sure that they don't overlap. And you'll see we get our our, our red, our green, and our blue channel um, all plotted side by side. And there's a bunch of different options to that plot images function. Um, it's very useful. Okay, so say we wanted, we were just interested in the red channel, right? So we, we have our, our image contained within M, right? And so I can use what's called the iNav slicer, right? And so this just indicates I want to slice on the navigation dimension um, or the navigation axis, which is the, the red, green, and blue channels. And I want to say, just give me the first one. And if I do that, you'll see I get just as, rather than, uh, I don't have any navigation dimension anymore. I just have a 512 by 512. And if I plot that, um, you'll see it opens up just one window, and it's just the red channel, as we expect. Uh, cool. Uh, we can use um, the hsplot.plot images again. Uh, plot images. And uh, if we want to, we can pick out more than one channel, right? So we could say im.inav, and we could say give me the first um, to the third channel. So in Python, slicing is 
excuse me, inclusive, it basically it's an inclusive set with the first one and an exclusive set. So this is going to give me channels one and two. Remember starting that, that they start at zero. So this is, if red is zero, green is one and blue is three, or sorry, blue is two, this is gonna give me one and two, which is green and blue. So I'm gonna sit and run that. And you should see, I get the, the green and the blue channels. Um, I could have also just said one colon, and that will give me from the first one to the rest. Um, and because there's only two, you'll see it gives me the, the same thing back. Um, I can also use um, negative indices uh, in Python. This is very useful as well. Um, if I type out the same thing in .inav, I can say, give me everything from um, the second to last uh, to, to, to the end. And so whenever you use a negative, it just index, starts indexing from, from the right side or from the end rather than from the beginning. If I run that, uh, you'll see I get the exact same output, the, the last two channels, as we expect. Um, Similarly, we can use the iSig. So rather than iNav, we can use iSig to, to slice in the, in the signal axis. Um, so we can say uh, m dot iSig. And then in this case, because we have two signal dimensions, right? We have x and y, uh, we have to give it two ranges to plot. So we can say, give me everything from the 128th pixel uh, from the left to the 128th pixel from the right, and then comma, and then give me everything from the top of the window uh, to um, 256 uh, pixels from, from the bottom. And I'll say plot that. And you'll see we get a nice um, a, a nice subset of, of that image. And again, we have our navigator because we didn't slice in the navigation dimension, right? So we still have our red, green, and blue channels. But this time, we've cropped out um, the area of interest. Uh, I don't know if you've been noticing, but we also have a scale bar that's put in here by default. Um, you can turn that on and off as you need. Um, like other things, you can chain commands together. So say we wanted just the red channel, uh, but we also wanted just this area. So I'm gonna copy and paste from there. And then on the end of that, I'm just gonna put dot .inav. Oops, sorry, my mouse was in the wrong spot. I'm gonna put dot .inav zero dot plot. And you'll see this time we get just one channel and it's in the, the, uh, the, the last, um, Sorry, it's just the, the, the signal area that we were interested in, right? The, the X and Y area, but then just the red channel as well. Uh, question, is there a command to repeat the last command that you have entered? Um, there, there is uh, within the Jupyter Notebook. Um, I believe it is uh, not the last command, but you can see you have a number up here that like an input number here, like number 58. I believe if you do uh, exclamation point 58, nope, that didn't work. Um, there is, I don't remember the syntax offhand. I apologize. <laughs> um, there's a way that you can access this by, by number. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm sure you could, you could probably look it up online. Uh, I apologize, I don't remember exactly. Um, so previously we've been accessing um, the data just by um, pixel values. So sort of pixel numbers and indexes. You can also, um, something that's very useful in HyperSpy is you can uh, do things by, uh, um, if calibrated units instead of just instead of just pixels. So in this case, um, our unit is calibrated in centimeters. Um, so we're going to do, uh, we can put in add markers and stuff like that. And so in this case, you can see we added a marker just on the bridge of her nose. Um, sorry, that was not part of the explanation that I was giving. Uh, you can use float indexing um, as well. That's what I was getting at to, to access um, portions of the image by calibrated units. So in this case, we're gonna go from um, negative five centimeters to five centimeters and negative two centimeters to, to two centimeters. Um, and we'll do that with the iSig uh, slicer again. So we'll say m dot iSig. And rather than uh, integers, we're going to pass in floats. And we do that by um, just putting in a decimal place. You can also put zero, but you don't have to. Um, so I'm going to say five zero. And I'm going to say negative two, um, two to two. And I'm going to say, maybe I'm just interested in the first, the, the first channel. And I'm going to say plot. And you'll see, um, as, we, as we've expected, um, we saw zero, zero was right at the bridge of her nose. So we've gone from negative five centimeters to five centimeters and negative two centimeters at the top to two centimeters down below. And so this becomes very useful if you know you're interested in a particular nanometer range or, or something like that in your image. Um, you can pick that out very easily. Okay, so um, interactive operations. I, I think I'm actually going to skip through this just because um, we're getting a little low on time, and I want to save enough time for uh, for the for the eels processing. So um, you can feel free to go through this part on your own. Um, it just describes how we can do interactive um, R, R, ROI, so we can sort of define an area of interest and then 
do things like summing it or taking averages, that sort of thing. Um, so I'll leave that as an exercise to the user. Um, so if you want to close this window, um, you can just close it, but that will also leave it open in the background. It'll leave the, the Python interpreter open if you just close the tab. So to actually shut this down and sort of clear out your variables and your memory and everything, you're going to want to go to File up here and then click Close and Halt. And that will take a little bit to sort of process that, oh, it's closing down. And then I, yep, it'll ask you if you want to close the window. So you say yes, leave. And you'll see, I don't know if you saw that very quickly, but this little notebook icon was green before, and now it's, it's back to gray because it's no longer open and active. Um, so we're going to go into the eels portion now. So if you click on just this uh, link to root folder, or you can click on these two double dots, that will get both will get you back up into that folder. And we're going to go into the eels, uh, the eels folder, and I'm going to click on eels analysis. And so this will take a few moments to just uh, load up, especially on my computer because it's very slow. Um, so this is going to be a, a brief tutorial on just how we can um, look at some of the eels functionality, the eels specific functionality that's built into Hyperspy. Um, and so that's going to be done uh, using an example eels data set from a perovskite oxide. I believe it's a lanthanum strontium manganese oxide. Um, and uh, we'll talk about both how we can access, we can deal with um, the core loss data, but also the, um, the uh, low loss data and zero loss peaks, that sort of stuff as well. Man, this computer is slow. I'm using, I have to use, a, because of WebEx, I have to use my really slow old Windows computer to, to do this. It's much faster on my modern computer. <laughs> so I apologize for, for, all, for all the uh, delays in, the, in this bit. Okay, so we have this open now. Um, right, so this data was collected on an atomic resolution um, JUL and ARM. Uh, it had dual eels, so they collected both uh, low loss and zero loss at the same time. And it was an LSMO um, thin film on top of a strontium titanate uh, substrate. Um, so we can do some simple quantification. Um, you can see here, uh, this option has the notebook uh, interface to matplotlib um, defined. So I'm going to change that to QT because I like when the windows pop up just for being able to display to you guys. And we actually, it's important to note that because we opened a new notebook, we're going to have to run all of these commands over again. Um, when you uh, when you shut down a notebook, you've basically closed off the Python interpreter that was running in the background. And so all of your variables have been cleared. Anything that you had imported has been cleared. Um, so you're going to have to go through and do that again. Um, on a normal machine, hopefully on your machine, this is running a little bit faster uh, and that's not such a, such a problem. Um, but I have like a five-year-old uh, portable tablet computer that is not meant for scientific analysis. So it takes a little bit, a little bit longer. So I apologize for that. Um, so while that's while that's running, I can just type in uh, what we're going to be doing here. So we're going to load. There's a file. Oh, sorry, my mouse is twitchy as well. Um, we're going to type in uh, hs.load, and our data sets in this case are within a folder called data sets. Um, so if we go back to here, uh, you can see we have a data sets folder, and we have a few um, folders just saved in uh, this type. This kind um, actually they're not in the hspy format. hspy is a new representation um, of the HDF5 format. So the default extension in Hyperspy used to just be HDF5, but we changed it to HSPY. But they're the same format, so you can you can load them as you expect. Um, so we're going to say data sets and then LSMO, and I'm going to tab complete. And hopefully that won't take too long. There we go. Um, so we're going to say uh, we're interested in the line scan of the LSMO on, on STO. And so we will load that, and that loads pretty quickly. And we can see very, very quickly, right from the last section, we know what the dimensions are, right? This is, it has a navigation dimension of 10. So it's, ju it's just a line scan. So there's just a single navigation dimension. And then each spectrum has 512 channels. So it's a, a relatively small um, spectral range or, or maybe the detector was binned uh, by, you know, by, by four or something like that. Um, so this is core loss data. So we can, we can always visualize that by doing s.plot as before. Oh, and I got an error, and that is because I just loaded the data, right? I, I loaded the data and returned it to the, the command prompt and forgot to put it into a variable, so I can't access it. So I have to make sure I assign that to a variable named s if I want to be able to access it later. And I come back down here and I say s.plot, and it works this time because I actually put it in the variable, like we expect. And, okay, this opened on two different monitors. I don't understand. I don't understand why, but that's, that's what it does. Um, and now it's being slow, and because it was on a high resolution monitor. Okay, there we go. Um, so you can see this is our eels signal navigate, our, our eels signal, just like before, like we had with our spectral image. 
And, but this time, rather than a um, two-dimensional sort of XY image, um, we use a, a same kind of um, display that you'd see in, uh, if you're used to it in digital micrograph for the line spectrum. Um, so you can see our navigator rather than a, a little box is now a full line. And so we can drag back and forth through this line spectrum and we can see how the eels, uh, the, the eels spectrum changes on the side. Um, one thing that some people get tripped up on, if, if you're trying to use the arrow keys to navigate through this, um, you still have to use the left and right to navigate through this act, uh, dimension, uh, through this uh, line scan. If you use up and down, nothing's going to happen, and sometimes that confuses people. Um, it's not the most intuitive, I, I apologize. But um, so you can just use left and right to navigate through there. Um, okay, so let's say we want to uh, do some basic processing on this. So one of the things that you'd often do on a core loss signal is just remove the background, right? So we can say we have an interactive command to do that. We can say s dot remove background. Back Round. and run that and you'll see it closed the plots and opened up a new copy of them um, so I'll go get those from behind here um, and now this is it's um, not super clear um, but this is actually interactive and I believe I have uh, sorry I believe I have a problem here with my my GUI hopefully this doesn't happen for you but um, this should be popping up a a little window preferences.gui. So it looks like somehow my um, my my GUI has got got, got messed up. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe when I ran a command before, I I reset it. So I'm going to say ipy or uh, traits UI equals true. And then if I run this, I should get. No, I'm not. Okay. Live tech demos. Wonderful. Uh, let's let's see if we can figure out what's going on here. This worked when I tested it last night, of course. GUIs, apologize. Let me just make sure I got my syntax there right. HS preferences. Oh, enable. Oh, so I know what happened. Um, when I ran this example command, and maybe this happened to you if you were following along, so I know exactly what happened. I ran this command in the previous notebook, um, and this is a hyperspy setting, a, gen a general hyperspy setting. And so what I did was I, I, I basically disabled the, the, the notebook GUI interface. Um, and so when I tried to call this, I, it tried to present to me the notebook interface, and, and it didn't know how to do it. So I have to say true there, and now should work. And I think I have to uh, restart my, my thing. I apologize. Um, so this is, you know, this can happen. Um, uh, we, this is a, an open source Python uh, uh, project and it is written entirely by um, just scientific, uh, written by researchers. So sometimes um, you run into some little um, um, hiccups here and there, and this is why we try to have a good community, right? So I'm going to close all of that down. I'm just going to reopen it, and this will take a, a few moments. I apologize. Um, but like I said, th um, this is a project that's had never, you know, it has no commercial support, um, and so it's written entirely by uh, people who are just scientists and contributing the code. That's not to say that the code is not of high quality. It's just sometimes it is not the most user-friendly, and this is a, a, a great example of that. So I apologize that you're seeing this, because I, I, I ran this last night, and it was, it was working perfectly fine. Um, but this is the kind of thing that you may, you may run into, um, and there's plenty of help resources for, for if you run into challenges. Um, but if you're not messing around with the default settings uh, like I just was, um, you shouldn't run into any problems, um, hopefully. Um, okay, so we're back at it. So I'm going to have to rerun these commands again. Um, so I'll do this, and I'll do this one. Uh, you can stack up commands, so you can start running them even when they're, they're not totally completed yet. Um, and I will make sure this is true. Uh, and this may take a little bit longer. So um, just in, in the meantime, uh, let me look through if there are any questions. Uh, import command to see last window. Okay, so it uh, looks like we're, we're back in action. So we'll run that and make sure we can plot. That looks good. Okay, we're 
back this came back onto the other screen so i will drag that back up and okay let's see if we can remove background this time and hopefully it works there we go okay great <laughs> emergency averted um, okay, so we get this, this interactive plot here, but we also get a little GUI in the notebook as well. Um, and you can see we get some help about it. We can collapse that if we want, or we can leave it open. Um, so this is now interactive. It's not immediately available, but it is if you read here. So if you just click and drag on your signal over here, you should get a little uh, window and it'll start fitting the background uh, as, as you click and drag the fit. And it shows you a preview of what the, um, of what the uh, resulting spectrum will look like. And once you're satisfied with that, you can drag this around and kind of see how it changes as, as you go through, um, as you go through the line spectrum, the line scan. Um, I'm going to uncheck, unclick fast here just because it cause, um, makes it a little less accurate. So I'm going to click apply and you'll see it does the subtraction and uh, it opens up these windows in the background again, unfortunately. Um, but if I open those back up, you'll see I have my new line spectrum, my, my, my line scan rather, and it has the background removed um, via power law, as, as you expect. Um, cool. So we can, um, to if we want to uh, start integrating signals, uh, like I showed in my presentation yesterday, we can use um, what's called an ROI to do that. We don't have to. We can do it in a different way, too, but um, many ways to do the same thing. So I'm going to say uh, ROI equals HS dot ROI. And then I'm going to, sorry, not minus, equals. And I'm going to say I want a span ROI. And I'm going to tell it I want to go from the 400, 450 to uh, 600. Um, and then I'm going to say s.plot. And I'm going to say ROI.add widget, add widget uh, to the s signal. And I'm going to tell it I want it to go onto the energy loss axis. Um, so I'm going to run that. And it will plot and open it up in the background again, unfortunately. Oh, and I got an error. What happened? Ac name axes is not defined. Okay, so what happened here is um, I've the command the the argument that I need to provide it is named axes, and I forgot to put an equal sign. So I just gave it something called axes, uh, and it didn't understand what that was. Um, so I'm going to rerun that, and these open in the background again, unfortunately. So I'll bring them to the front, and you can see we have this ROI now that is referenced on our uh, display here, and uh, we can sort of interactively change this if we want. So we can click and drag on it and it will um, kind of show, we, we can move it around. Um, so say we want to integrate just this area there. Um, so we can do that very easily. Um, so we can use our, our ROI to slice our data, right? So I can say STI, uh, so you know just the titanium spectrum. And I'm going to say S.ISIG. So remember, I'm slicing in the signal dimension, which is the energy axis here. And I'm going to say, rather than from you know, 400 or 400 to 600 or, or whatever, um, I'm going to give it the ROI variable up here. Remember, we have this interactive ROI here. So I can just pass that um, over here. And I'm going to say, OK, for that little area, I want to integrate that along one dimension. And I want to do it along the uh, energy loss axis. And what did I, oh, sorry, I mistyped axis. Um, so if, if you get an error like that and that's confusing to you, um, if you remember, there's always help. Um, you can either press uh, shift tab here and it should, uh, sorry, or maybe tab. Maybe it's not going to work. Um, you can also, you can use the question mark. So I could say, uh, I want question mark there and it should pop it open oh, and finally opened my Oh, it didn't, it didn't find it. I, I, I apologize. Um, STI equals. Um, if my computer were faster, you would get, um, basically it has to evaluate this interactively, and so it's not happening on my slow computer, so I apologize. But it would show you the documentation of how to, of what you can access in that function. Um, so I, I run that. Um, and then I can say uh, STI dot plot. And you'll see this time we will get a, another signal that opens in the background here. And we get an integrated signal this time. So this is across our, uh, remember, we go from 0 to about 25 here. And you can see our, our integrated signal goes from 0 to 25-ish nanometers. And you can see we have 
Um, lots of titanium at the beginning, and just as you'd expect as we go to the end, uh, we, have, we have less uh, integrated there as well. Um, so we could have done that all in one line, uh, which would be probably a little easier, and that's how, that, that's how I would have done it. Um, so we can, uh, I'm just gonna reload the, uh, sorry, um, clear that cell. I'm gonna reload the data, uh, just so, because we've already subtracted the background, so I wanna make sure I reload the, the, the raw value. And uh, I'm going to copy and paste this for the uh, sake of time, but I will talk through it. So I, I can go through and I can say, okay, STI instead. I'm going to say S dot remove background, and I'm going to tell it specifically the signal range I want to fit the background in, so I don't have to interactively do that. So once you figure that out, this is a very quick way to process lots of data. And then I'm going to tell it, okay, I'm interested only in the range from 448 EV to 480 EV, and then I want to integrate that directly. So I can do that all on one line just by chaining those commands together as we've seen. And if I run sti.plot, I get the exact same, the exact same result. So um, once you become comfortable with the syntax of, of hyperspy, this is probably more how you'll you'll operate. Um, you could also have set, you could also have just put this on um, say equals sti.isig, and then you could have said STI3 equals STI2 dot integrate. So you could have done, done it this way as well. You could put it onto separate lines. And now if I say STI3 dot plot, you should see I get the exact same result. So um, there's many ways that you can accomplish the same thing, but once you become comfortable, it, it becomes not pretty second nature to just sort of start chaining things together. Uh, question here, what, what options do we have to subtract the background in the low loss range? So you mean in, in like the plasmon region, or do you mean extracting the zero loss peak and, and that sort of that sort of stuff. Um, there, there's there's a few different um, if I if I run just um, s dot remove background and press shift tab a couple times. Uh, if you press shift tab a number of times it should open up. So this it worked this time. I apologize that it wasn't working on the previous command. Um, so you can see that there's an option to this function called background type. Um, so by default it uses power law. Um, but there are other components. There's a gap. You can use a Gaussian component. You can use a, just a linear offset. Uh, there's a polynomial component that you can use. Um, and you could, once you get into curve modeling and, and that sort of stuff, this is sort of a very basic uh, curve modeling. And you can do it more manually if you wanted to as well. And, and, we'll, and we'll show that. Um, so you have a few different options in, as far as just the remove background function goes. But then we also have um, other options as, as well. Um, okay, so curve fitting quantification. So this is where things get a little bit interesting. So, um, and, and it starts to become a little more powerful than what you can get in, um, say, in digital micrograph by default. So um, this is a nice thing to show. Um, so we can say, we're gonna, because this was a parallel uh, yield spectrum, I'm gonna load both the low loss uh, data, uh, which is in the LS, LSMO, line scan low loss, so I'll load that, and I'm going to load the uh, core loss data as well. Data sets uh, LSMO. I think this was already loaded, but I'm just going to load it again just in case. Um, so there's a just a small uh, wrinkle here. Um, so Hyperspy by default contains the hydrogenic cross sections, and if you don't know yields, this is going to fly over your head, and that's okay. But for those of you who have done yields quantification, hopefully this makes sense. Um, so by default, it, uh, it includes uh, Ray Edgerton's hydrogenic cross sections, which are freely published, um, but also only applied to the K and L edges. So you can't do any modeling um, of the fine structure uh, or anything of the M edges um, by default in Hyperspy. And that is because um, those are provided within digital micrograph and uh, GITAM does not provide a license to, uh, does not provide those freely. So you have to have a digital micrograph EELS license to access those, um, those cross sections. So if you want more accurate curve fitting, um, basically if you have uh, digital micrograph installed, you have to tell Hyperspy where those cross sections are. Um, so if you have, and I can help you through this afterwards, but if you have digital micrograph, if you have the EELS option, then you have EELS installed, so you have those cross sections on your computer, they're just in a certain place and we have to tell Hyperspy where to find them. Um, right now, I think the, uh, I think the EELS option is uh, they've made it free if you if you want to download digital micrograph right now um, during the sort of while everyone's staying at home. Um, so you can uh, within the preferences GUI, there's a place to specify where those are. So um, 
if you put it in eels. So I copied those to a directory on my machine, but you could also point this at your digital micrograph installation directory, and that would, uh, it would recognize those. Um, and if you try to use them and it doesn't recognize them, it'll give you an error. So that's just um, something to, to be aware of. Um, okay, so I'm gonna use them just because they're a little bit more, uh, make it a little bit more, uh, accurate, but if you if you don't have them available, that, that's okay. We provide the commands to, to do that otherwise. Um, so let's take a look at what's what's in the metadata, right? So um, we can see some experimental parameters. We know this was a 200 keV beam or uh, 200 keV beam, uh, 200 keV accelerating voltage, 200 keV beam. Uh, we have the convergence and collection angle set and, and the dwell time and such. And we can see that it's an EELS energy, so, or an EELS spectrum rather. So if we plot this, um, Let's take a look at, or sorry, let's plot the low loss uh, and take a look at that. And you'll see, um, okay, it looks like a low loss spectrum, but if we zoom in a little bit here, if we use our little magnifying glass and zoom in, um, you can see that zero is right, right about here. So it looks like our, our zero loss peak is misaligned a little bit. And this, is, this, this will happen if you don't tune your, um, tune your spectrometer regularly. Um, so we have a function built in to, to fix this very easily. And so that is um, S, and in this case, we're looking at the low loss peak and we want to align the zero loss peak. So that's one of those functions there. And so we'll say align zero loss peak and uh, it can operate just on a pixel basis or you can have sub pixel accuracy. So we're gonna ask it, ask, ask it to use sub pixel accuracy. And then we're gonna say also align and we're gonna give it a list, sorry, equals. And we're gonna give it a list here uh, with our core loss spectrum. And what that's going to do is um, take whatever shift it applies to the zero loss peak and it, it it, uh, uh, it it decides is appropriate to apply to the zero loss peak and apply that also to our core loss spectrum. So that's important, right? Because you don't want to introduce some sort of um, offset error. Uh, you want to align both of them. So that'll take just a moment to run. And it looks like it didn't finish, but it, it did finish. I think that's just um, a little, maybe a little bug there. Um, and so if now I say SLL plot and I look at this again, uh, a little hard to see, um, but hold on, let me, uh, because the zero loss peak is so tall, it's a little hard to see, but you can see now zero is pretty much in the, in the center of that zero loss peak. It looks like the zero loss peak is slightly asymmetric, so we can't fix that just with this function, but um, it, it is at least intensity aligned. Okay, um, so we can run, uh, we can use what's called the add elements function to tell Hyperspire that we have elements of interest. So um, if you do not have the Gatan uh, GOS tables installed, you would use this first line um, because uh, we can't get we can't do quantification on the lanthanum um, because we don't have access to the M. But I do have those installed, so I'm going to say add all of those. Um, and if now I look at s.metadata, you'll see a new uh, a, a new piece got added to the metadata, a sample tree uh, got uh, or a, a leaf of the metadata sample, and it also it has a an element called elements um, that defines which elements have been defined as being present in in that sample. Uh, okay, so we can also create a, once we have defined those elements, uh, we can create a model. So again, each one of these commands has, if you're only using the hydrogenic cross sections, by which is the default, or if you have the Hartree Slater ones installed, so I'm going to do this. Um, if, if we have hydrosonic, hydrogenics, um, basically all we're doing is cropping out the lanthanum edge, so we don't include it, but I'm going to include it because we can. Um, so we use the S create dot create model and we say we tell it that uh, we give it a reference to the low loss uh, spectrum um, so now if we look at what's in m we see we have a, a new type of class so it's not an eel spectrum it's an eels model um, and it's referenced to a particular excuse me a particular spectrum which is the uh, high loss or core loss uh, spec spectrum image um, so if we look at what is in the components attribute you'll see we added uh, a particular number of components automatically, and this was done by inspecting what elements are present in the in the spectrum. Um, and so we saw, you know, we added titanium, oxygen, manganese, and lanthanum, and so we get edges for each one of those. And we also get a power law background uh, by default. Um, so you can not include that, or um, to Maureen, your, Maureen, your question earlier, um, you could change this background model um, as as you wanted. Um, Usually you just want a power law, so we include that by default, but um, we don't have to do that. Um, okay, so if we want to fit that model, uh, we use the function multi-fit. So we say M, not S this time, because we're operating on the model. So we say M multi-fit, 
And basically what multi means is that it's just going to fit the entire spectrum image rather than just a single pixel. And we're going to tell it that we want to do a smart kind of fitting. Um, so that just makes you feel good, right? It makes you think that it's going to do something smart um, by default. But what that really means is just that um, it, it basically goes through and fits these components in a particular order um, where sort of the lower energy one or the higher energy ones that shouldn't impact the lower energy ones are fitted first. Um, so that way you sort of stack up the um, like the um, the the, the tail of the edge effect as you go across. Um, so that's just um, when you're doing eels data, you typically want to apply the smart uh, kind of fit. Uh, great. So I can say now m dot plot because we've completed fitting that model, and I will run that, and you'll get you'll see we get a slightly different um, output than if we're just plotting the signal. So this time the raw signal is in these dots, and then the blue is the uh, the fitted model. And so we can drag that across the spectrum image, and we can see that um, we did the fit at each pixel, right? And you can see it's not great, right? We, there's obviously a lot of fine structure here, and there's some white lines that don't get included in the fit. And so we can do a lot better than this. Um, but we can also just check the error of, we can check sort of the intensity of the fit of, of those different signals as we go across uh, the spectrum image. So we can define just a list of edges that we want to do. And so you don't have to worry about the um, syntax here, but essentially all this is doing is getting the intensity of each edge as fitted in the, by the model. And then it plots it as a, a, a line scan essentially. So this is now from zero to 25-ish nanometers. We have oxygen, uh, titanium, lanthanum, and manganese. And you can see um, we got some fit, right? We can see that the oxygen edge is the most intense and there's some sort of drop in, in, in the middle here or something like that, um, but it's not a very good fit, right? And we can, we can see that very quickly just by looking at, at, at the model. Um, we got sort of the general features, but we can do better. Um, so one of the things we can do is if we know we have some chemical shift in our edge positions, we can say m dot enable adjust positions, and that will plot our our model again. But this time we get a little uh, a little interactive browser, and so we can see the oxygen edge is a little bit off, right? Because of some chemical shift. So maybe we can we can shift that. Um, you can just click and drag on there. We can go and inspect some of the other ones. This one looks like it's a little off, so maybe maybe we'll uh, we'll do that. And okay, that looks that looks not bad. Um, you can also do this manually. So uh, this is how I would recommend doing it, right? So you can you can access the onset energy parameter of any components. So you can say m dot components, and we have our oxygen k edge. And we can say onset uh, energy, and we can set its value to uh, 528. Um, and if I had this open, you you would have if I had the plot still open, you would have seen that that changed in the plot uh, interactively. Um, so that does. It, that sets the value just for the current position, right? So we, we have many positions in our spec, in our line scan. So uh, we're going to call one last uh, function, which is assign current value to all. Um, so we will say onset energy, sorry, not value. We will say assign current value to all. And that's just going to take the values of the onset energy parameter um, at the current position and apply it to the entire spectrum image. Um, and so we're going to do this for uh, the others as well. So let's take a look at the manganese one. Um, we'll see that it's currently 635. Um, if we look at the uh, the LQ, we'll see it's uh, 646. Um, and now, if we, we maybe we want to assign this to we want to set it to uh, the L3 to 638.5. We know that's that's a little bit more accurate. Um, we should see that the uh, the L2 gets offset as well because the, the ratio or the, the offset between the L2 and the L3 edges is fixed by physics, right? So um, we can see by, by updating the L3, the, the model is smart enough to also update the L2 to make sure that it, that it matches. Um, the other reason that the fit wasn't that great is that we um, didn't actually fit any of the fine structure. So we can say enable fine structure. Um, this will be a good time for questions, especially on my machine, because this is going to take a, a little bit of time. Um, once you start en enabling the fine structure, um, the fit can take a little while. Um, so that would be a great time. We get a little warning there because of maybe some some uh, some issues with the data, but that's 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 not a problem. Um, so now would be a great time uh, for any questions because this is going to take a couple of minutes to run. Um, I think we only have a few more minutes left anyway. But um, so any general questions that you guys have, I'd be happy to to answer at this at this time. Well, well. While this runs. Uh, or, or another thing, uh, another useful thing that we could do at this time is if I go back to pages.nist.gov, hyperspy tutorial. Uh, 
Um, so one of the things that I wanted to point out here um, from the CyberSpy tutorial website um, that Sam sent out, there's a link here to the user guide. Um, so I just want to sort of run through this very quickly while that command is running. Uh, but just because this is something that um, will be very useful to you as you're sort of getting started. And I, I really, if you have the time, I recommend reading through all of it. Um, you know, it'll really explain everything that HyperSpy can do. Um, and there's very extensive documentation. Um, so it starts off just at this the sort of um, table of contents there, but uh, you can see how many, how many things are in there. Um, so you can go, it has everything from sort of what is HyperSpy, how is it designed, um, how you install it. Um, so you can use the bundle installers like I provided in that in that website, or you can. There's other ways if you already have Python to install it. Um, how you get started, how you uh, load data. So we loaded data from a uh, you know from a file, so from a digital micrograph file. Um, but if you have your data just in like a NumPy array, so say, say you have it in a MATLAB file that's a, a matrix, there are ways. Basically, as long as you can get your data into an array of numbers, uh, you can you can. Uh, analyze it with with hyperspy so you can use all the curve fitting and everything even if it's not even if it's not eels um, we also have some example data we have um, there's a connection to the eels database um, if you wanted to use that uh, there's descriptions about the um, you know the the signal and navigation dimensions like I said this is very verbose um, it fully explains pretty much everything you can do within hyperspy so um, I really recommend taking a look through it uh, let me take a look back here and see how this is running oh man this is going to take 19 minutes, 13 minutes. Okay, so I'm going to cancel this. I don't know. This took a minute and a half on my machine last night, so I'm not sure what's going on. That's slower today. Maybe uh, because WebEx is running at the same time, it's eating up all my CPU. Um, but anyway, so this would have actually fit the. Um, maybe I can, I can open the, this this presentation because I showed one of these. Uh, sorry, uh, I believe I showed one of these. Uh, yeah. Um, so this this was a result of basically I was just running through the demo and I, I copied that demo and, and set it here. So so this is kind of the fitting result that you would get um, after running through that that fit, and it would be there at every single uh, every single pixel. Um, and then you can just map rather the titanium intensity across. You know, using rather than doing an intensity map, you can actually just get the value of this parameter. Uh, and, and plot that directly. And so you've done a full sort of model fitting and you can evaluate, okay, how good is how good is my fit? And that's a little bit, uh, probably a little bit more accurate than doing sort of the, the background subtraction and um, and integration. Although it takes longer, it's it's much more accurate because you've accounted for basically every source of signal uh, within within your data set. Um, so I apologize for for having to cancel that, but I'm not quite sure why that was taking 20 minutes. And we don't we don't have 20 minutes. Um, okay, so I think most of this uh, is um, pretty much the same. So when we went through that the first time, you would see, I, I, I don't have it sh shown here interactively, but you would have seen, um, you know, this isn't a cooking show where I have the, the completed one in, in the oven, um, but you would have seen that there were some negative values um, in the fit that are just because of the way that the math worked out. Um, so we can set um, bounded minimizations for the, uh, you know, for, for different um, components. Um, so that we use the the b min um, uh, attribute of the of a particular component. So to do that, we would say something like um, uh, m dot components uh, dot m say m n l three in this case, and we'll say intensity because that's the that's the value that we're interested in. So not the onset energy this time, but the intensity, and we can set the bounded minimum to zero point zero, and we could do that for each of the intensities uh, in in the model. And then um, if we reran the, the multi-fit, um, we can use a, a, a different type of fitter. So you can see if I say m.multifit and uh, look at the documentation for this function, you can see that uh, there's a couple options here. Um, we can show a progress bar, we can make it interactive. Uh, let's see if I can open this. I don't know if it will show it in here. Um, it does not show it in here um, because fit uh, is, it's an, actually an argument of fit. Um, so you can see we have an option for fitter here in the fit option. And so we have other, we have MP fit, we have ODR, we have a least square. So there's there's a couple different mathematical fitters, the optimizers essentially that you can use if you remember um, the talk from yesterday about different optimizers. Um, these are all built into to Python, right? So, or, or SciPy actually. So um, we're not providing those, but basically they have different uh, capabilities 
and the, uh, the, the least squares one um, is the one that has bounded minimization. So what that means is we can say kind equals smart, and then at the very end, we can say bound, bounded equals true. And essentially what that will do is go through and perform the fit and make sure that it stays uh, within the bounds that we, that we specified. So if you know you have a certain value, um, you know, that you can't, you know, you, we know the intensity is never going to be negative, right? So we might as well bound it to that and, and see what we can get. Um, okay, I think, Sam, what time was I going to? I think it was around now, wasn't it? Yep. Uh, you have eight more minutes if you like. There's a uh, few questions after Maureen's. Okay. Oh yeah, Maureen's didn't. Sorry, my, my question and answer box didn't uh, scroll down. Um, what's the difference between attribute and method? Okay, so that's a Python terminology. Um, so that an attribute is if you have, um, for instance, uh, a method can be an attribute. So that's kind of confusing to say. But basically, if you have an object, such in this case we have M, which contains our our model, right? Um, Basically, attributes are um, things that are stored within that object. And so um, an attribute can usually is just a sort of a variable contained within that object. Um, so in this case, we have a components attribute of the model. The components has an attribute named manganese L3. The manganese L3 parameter has an attribute called intensity. And that intensity has an attribute called B min, and we can set the value of that attribute to zero. So that's when I say attribute, usually I'm just meaning something after the dot, essentially. <laughs> um, and uh, a method is actually, in some ways, an attribute as well, because it's also stored within the method, or sorry, within the, within the object. But a, a method is something that you call, right? It's, it's a, a bit of code that you run. So an attribute is sort of like a value that you store in a, in a particular object. And a method is something that you would actually run. So that's, say, uh, run the plot function and do and, and provide me some output or or run the fit function and, and and provide me some some output and i say function and method i use those interchangeably uh, even though I, I probably shouldn't but um those are those are the same thing so hopefully that that clears that up uh tara had a question so the smart algorithm in hyperspy takes care of overlapping edges it does not uh not in the way that i think you want it to <laughs> that, that that you mean um if you have a lot of overlap within you know if you have two edges that are maybe you know within 30 ev of each other or something um it'll try its best but there's still going to be basically you're going to end up with a really complicated fine structure on top of another entire edge and so it will try to fit that and it's going to fit it like i said from highest energy to lowest um it may work but it may still basically the, um, the fit is it's not magic right it's still just doing like a least squares optimization or something and so if it can't find the right combination of parameters that that match that then it's still going to have some trouble so um if you have highly overlapping edges that's it should be able to get it but it may not um and that's the sort of situation where if you have a lot of data so say you have a spectrum image with with a lot of different pixels that's where i would recommend maybe up using the signal separation and the machine learning approach that I uh, sort of demonstrated briefly yesterday. Um, and if you want to get started with that, there's an entire section, um, uh, where is it, machine learning here in the user guide. Um, there's an entire section on how you can sort of get started with that and do signal separation and all the stuff that I was displaying yesterday. So, so if you have really strongly overlapping edges, that's what I'd recommend. If you can try the model fitting and maybe it works, um, but maybe it, maybe it doesn't work. Uh, how would you measure the thickness? Uh, that's a great question. I think maybe I skipped over that one. Oh, no, I, that was in the next section. So I'm just going to run through this um, little bit of the section very quickly. Um, so just so I can answer that question. That was a good leading question. Um, so I'm going to reload this, this LSMO line scan uh, data set. And uh, I'm also going to reload the low loss here. And I'm not going to plot them just because we've seen these before. Um, but I am going to align the zero loss peak uh, like we did before. Um, and that's just because we did some, we potentially did some model fitting and, and everything that, that really messed things up. Um, so that, that ran, I think, I, the reason I think this is looks like it didn't finish, but it did appear is I just think I think WebEx is really just <laughs> killing my um, my CPU usage. So so there's a function um, here that we have uh, called estimate thickness. So we can say um, s thickness uh, equals SLL. So right, we estimate thickness uh, on the low loss spectrum. 
Um, so we can just say it has a sort of name that makes sense, which is just estimate thickness. Um, and then we're going to give it a threshold. Um, and so this is just uh, basically a threshold to define the, 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 get, the uh, boundary between what we're considering the zero loss peak and what we're considering the low loss peak, or, or like the low loss plasmon region. And so this is an example of something that um, in digital micrograph, if you were to uh, estimate the thickness, I think, I, I don't think I can do this. Oh, I can compute thickness. If you go in here into the preferences, um, there's some zero loss models and, and that sort of stuff, but it, it hides a lot of the complications of all of this to you by default. Um, and I think in some ways that's good because it makes it easier to use, but in some ways it makes it so you don't really know what's happening. Um, so there's always this sort of thresholding going on of determining the boundary between what's zero loss and what's not. And that's not made immediately clear in a lot of the GUI software. Whereas when you do it in, in this sort of um, environment, we give you a reasonable default, but we also give you the, the, the power and we, and we show it to you very front and center of, of how you can basically, what, what values you can tweak, what parameters you can tweak to try to get a better value, you know, a better result. And I think that gives you a little bit better understanding of, of, of how the methods actually work. Um, when I went through this in grad school and I started, I started seeing all the things that you could change, I said, well, there, aren't, there aren't that many options in digital micrograph. I can't, I didn't even know I could change those things. Maybe I don't, maybe I don't want to, and that's fine too. But anyway, so we can run that and that runs pretty quickly. Um, and if we look at what is in S thickness now, um, you'll see it's a base signal um, and its dimensions are just 40. So it's just the intensity along the line. And if I plot that, um, you'll see this time it opens it up all the way. You'll see we get our, our thickness and it's a relative thickness in terms of T over lambda. Um, so it, the, the value is essentially T over lambda you can see up here um, over the mean free path. And you can see it starts at about 3.37 or so and goes up to about 0.7-ish. So you can see we have sort of a slope in the thickness of this sample where the data was taken. Um, but you can do this for uh, a spectrum image. You can do it for a 2D spectrum image um, as well. Um, and then you could, you know, if you know your mean free path, you could multiply it out, you know, assuming it's constant across, across the whole thing. Um, so basically all of the methods that are sort of implemented within the, this EEL, so like compute thickness and zero loss extraction and, and correcting and all that stuff, you can do all of that in HyperSpy um, pretty easily. Um, Tarn has another question. Can we load predefined standards to fit our spectrum? Um, and yes, we can. Um, let me, uh, I believe it's in here in the user guide in the energy, the EELS uh, part, uh, thickness estimation, parameter scoring, EELS curve fitting. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Oh, no, it's not. It's not in here. Um, but if I if I come in here, or, sorry, if I come in here, um, and I just say, you know, I have this this model still M. Um, or sorry, uh, I'm going to look at what's in the HS dot model dot components. Yeah. Comp and so these are the possible components that you can add to a uh, to a model. Um, so you do have a little right? tangent and uh, you know please tell and gaussian and all this sort of stuff. Um, hopefully you can still see my network is having some some issues. Um, but you know, we have all of those. Um, we have the EELS core loss edge, which is the ones that we were adding by default. But we also have this one called scalable fixed pattern. And essentially what that is, is um, you can load in a, any type of signal that it, you basically will maintain its relative intensities throughout the signal, but you can scale it up and down and shift it left and right if, you know, as you want. Um, and that will allow you to um, load in, say, if you wanted to fit something like that. 